For centuries, the Middle East has been considered the cradle of civilization. The acceptance of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the Great Pyramids of Egypt, the laws of Hammurabi. These are the legacies of Middle Eastern societies that flourished 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. Yet scientists had little evidence that ancient American civilizations were capable of creating such grand works. The discovery of prehistoric earthworks in rural Louisiana has revolutionized historians' view of the evolution of society in the New World. Over the last 50 years, archaeologists have explored and excavated numerous Louisiana earthwork sites. Located in the northeastern part of the state, the site at Poverty Point Plantation includes some of the largest American earthworks of the prehistoric period. In the lower Mississippi Valley, there's a long history of earthwork development. It may last uh, probably 7,000 years, maybe 6,500 years, uh, and of all places of the United States. This is the, the, the one area where the earthworks first came about. In the 1840s, Jacob Walters, an explorer traveling through the area looking for lead ore, first reported the presence of Native American artifacts on the Poverty Point site. However, it wasn't until the 1950s that the discovery of a 20-year-old aerial photograph revealed the site's unique form. Poverty Point contains a man-made earthen structure so large that it defies recognition from the ground. This revelation eventually led scientists to uncover new evidence of a highly developed ancient American culture. For the last 40 years, the Poverty Point site has been carefully excavated by archaeologists from all over the country. Piecing together all of the details of daily life in extinct cultures is not an exact science, but an interpretive art. The inhabitants who built the site abandoned the area more than 3,300 years ago. While there are still unanswered questions, archaeologists do know many things about where the people lived, what foods they ate, and how they made tools. Scientists' findings are based on three major sources the earthen ridges, the mounds, and artifacts found at Poverty Point and at similar settlements in the lower Mississippi Valley. Based on artifacts, scientists also have begun to reconstruct the society's organization and its government. This is going along with the pit work to tie everything together to try to make a comprehensive set of data that will then compile into a book and will hopefully become very useful to archaeologists studying this site to either verify uh, some of their ideas or to come up with new ones. Between 1800 B.C. and 1350 B.C., the people of Poverty Point inhabited a region of the lower Mississippi Delta. I guess we'll probably never know exactly why Poverty Point people settled exactly where they did. Uh, I have a feeling that that is probably largely a matter of socioeconomics or perhaps a, a, a socio-political uh, factor. But obviously the Poverty Point peoples liked the margins of the ridges like Mason Ridge. This has afforded them high ground, relatively immune from flooding, uh, with good arable soils and good locations for, for living conditions. But perhaps more importantly, this enabled them to be immediately adjacent to these very rich bottomland uh, forest and hardwood areas that are so abundant as far as plants and wildlife and fisheries are concerned. At the heart of the Poverty Point site are the earthworks. One of the largest native constructions known in eastern North America, the Poverty Point earthworks are older than any other earthworks of this size in the Western Hemisphere. From here to somewhere about here, uh, we probably have 25, 50 years 
I can't imagine a people working on something as masterful as these rings for longer than a generation or two. By the time you've run through several generations, people have forgotten what you started building them for. A C-shaped figure dominates the center of the site. The figure is formed by six concentric artificial earth embankments. They're separated by ditches or swales where dirt was removed to build the ridges. The ends of the outermost ridge are 1,204 meters apart, nearly three quarters of a mile. The ends of the interior embankment are 594 meters apart. If the ridges were straightened and laid end to end, they would comprise an embankment 12 kilometers or seven and one-half miles in length. Originally, the ridges stood four to six feet high and 140 to 200 feet apart. Many years of plowing have reduced some to only one foot in height. Archaeologists suspect that the homes of 500 to 1,000 inhabitants were located on these ridges. The Poverty Point earthworks were originally constructed around 1800 years B.C., but we know that they were not the first earthworks built by Native Americans in Louisiana. For example, nearby to Poverty Point, uh, a little bit southwest of Monroe, Louisiana, the Watson Break earthworks were constructed as early as 3300 years B.C. What is important about that is that we begin to see this continuum of development in earthwork construction from uh, the time of Watson Break all the way up through European contact when at the Grand Village of the Natchez the earthworks were still occupied by Native Americans and we actually have accounts from the original European explorers into the region. Mounds were still being constructed in Louisiana in the mid-1500s. During the 1800s, some mounds in southern Louisiana were used for traditional religious activities. Today, the mounds continue to be sacred and powerful places. In the center of the Poverty Point earthworks is the plaza, a flat, open area covering about 15 hectares, or 37 acres. Archaeologists suspect the plaza was the site of ceremonies, rituals, dances, games, and other public activities. On the western side of the plaza, archaeologists have found some unusually deep pits. One explanation is these holes once held huge wooden posts which served as calendar markers. Using the sun's shadows, the inhabitants could have predicted the changing of the seasons. Also located within the plaza are Dunbar Mound and Sarah's Mount. Evidence suggests Sarah's Mount was constructed approximately 1,000 years after the decline of the Poverty Point culture. The mounds at Poverty Point uh, probably served a variety of purposes, but their form and their particular location suggest that they were part of the, uh, uh, the insurance, the protection system that uh, these Indians had set up to uh, kind of look after their way of life. They've got six mounds that form a square, or at least a partial square. They have six rings that form a semicircle. So they were, looked like they were uh, uh, two, two methods of, of um, using some insurance to, to protect their activities in the, in, inside. Because we know that southeastern Indians uh, believe that geometry uh, is the main protection against outside evil. Outside the ridged enclosure are five other mounds. Mound A and Motley Mound appear to many to be in the shape of a bird in flight. Mound A, or the bird mound as some refer to it, is singly one of the largest features that these people constructed while they are here. Today it rises about 72 feet in the air, would measure about 600 by 800 feet at its base. If you take these figures, translate that into cubic yards, you're looking at over 300,000 in its construction. And then if we took that figure and translated it into 50-pound baskets, you're looking at well over 10 million that went in this one mound alone. That's pretty impressive. See the bird-shaped mound that we have here? You'd have to be about 1,000 feet in the air. It's, it's truly that large. Now we've just left this platform tail, which is about 32 feet above the surrounding area. And again, if one sees the bird shape, looking here into the stairs, you'd see the middle of the bird's back, 
and then breaking out equally to the north and to the south, representing the wings. As you'd almost see this again, flying away from the concentric terraces uh, into the west, and it is on an east-west axis, so it's very carefully laid out. The bird mound, having suffered through some 3,000 years of erosion, would be about 72 feet today. Of course, we speculate that it might have been as high as 100 feet upon its construction. Now, from the 100 feet, given its position in the village, one could very easily look over the entire village area. Motley Mound may be considered to be unfinished. There is only a small bulge where the bird's tail should be. Scientists believe these mounds were used for special activities or as a gathering place for the elite. Mound B is a domed mound, 180 feet in diameter and 20 feet in height. Throughout the eastern United States, domed mounds were frequently used for burial. However, no burial sites have been excavated at Poverty Point. Ballcourt Mound is a nearly square, flat-topped mound about 100 meters or 300 feet to the side. Lower Jackson Mound is estimated to be as much as 1,000 years older than other mounds at the site. What this points to is that people came back to the Poverty Point site after the original occupation and not only con continued to conduct activities here, but actually continued adding on to the earthwork as well, up to a period of all oh, about 700 AD. In terms of the, the artifacts, Poverty Point probably uh, contains just about every kind of, of artifact that was made by the uh, archaic peoples in the eastern United States. Uh, it also has some artifacts that uh, were not made by the uh, general uh, southeastern peoples or other eastern peoples. Besides the construction of the colossal earthworks and mounds, another hallmark of the Poverty Point culture is long-distance trade. One of the differences between the Poverty Point cultures and those which immediately followed were the later cultures, first of all, did not build build the monumental architecture of the earthen ridges and large mounds like we see here at Poverty Point. The other thing which is very important as well is although there was some trade that continued into the later cultures, it was not on anywhere near as an extensive as a level as we have here at Poverty Point uh, during the heyday of the Poverty Point occupation. Since there were no local stones on the Macon Ridge, rocks were major trade goods. Other materials, such as food, may have also been traded. Due to lack of preservation and soil erosion, little archaeological evidence of these goods remains. The people of Poverty Point acquired stones from the Washita, Ozark, and Appalachian Mountains, and even copper from the Great Lakes, 1,400 miles away. Rivers were almost certainly used in bringing in the trade materials into Poverty Point because we're talking about such a massive volume of material. In fact, we've estimated that over 71 metric tons of foreign flint has, uh, is, occurs on the, the Poverty Point site. Some were traded in a natural condition, but many were circulated in finished forms. While some rocks were used to make tools, others were used to create ornaments or symbolic objects. The extensive trade network of the Poverty Point culture is one big difference with the earlier Watson Brake Indians who relied only on local raw materials for manufacturing tools. Located between the woodlands and the swamplands, the Macon Ridge was rich in plant and animal food sources. Archaeologists have recently found evidence of what appears to have been a large lake where there is now only farmland. The predominance of fish and reptile bones at the site suggests most of their food came from slow-moving water. Fishermen may have used cast and gill fishing nets weighted with plummets to capture the fish. You really don't have to angle to catch fish. You can set out a trap and you can set out a net and let the netting do the work for you while you come and work on the ranks, while you come and build the mounds, while you, do, while you, while you go hunting. So it's kind of an absentee work system, but boy, it put a lot of food in their larders. Besides fish and plants, deer, rabbits, geese, ducks, and turkeys flourished in this habitat. Hunters stalked their prey with spears. To provide added power and distance, the inhabitants used atlatls, or spear throwers. Atlatl hooks were sometimes made of carved antler. 
Polished stone weights were attached to help transfer the force of the throwing motion to the spear. Foods were prepared with a variety of tools. Animals were butchered with stone cleavers and blades. Nuts, acorns, and seeds were pounded into flour and oil with pitted stones and mortars. The food was cooked in open hearths and earth ovens. A hole was dug in the ground. Hot clay balls were packed around the food to regulate heat. We've actually done experiments with the different shapes of these objects and have found that if you cook with 40 of these objects in a pit but change the shape from, say, a cylinder to a round one to an irregular uh, grooved object, that you actually vary the heating temperature in those pits. The people of Poverty Point use stone and clay bowls and pots for cooking and storage. With stone chisels, the inhabitants carved containers from sandstone and soapstone, which was imported from Georgia and Alabama. Broken pieces of containers were sometimes made into beads, pendants, or plummets. Archaeologists have found a variety of items that verify food sources and preparation. However, the materials used to make housing and clothing disintegrate with time. So scientists have very few artifacts to document these aspects of life. There are also a couple of other problems just in trying to find evidence of these houses. For example, the ridges at Poverty Point have been extensively plowed for the last hundred or so years. And it was not until 1972 when Poverty Point became a public uh, earthwork that uh, crops were no longer planted on the ridges. So if people were in fact living up on the ridges, uh, the plowing activities would have destroyed any evidence of their houses or certainly would have altered them such that we cannot recognize that evidence today. Combining their findings at Poverty Point with evidence from similar sites, archaeologists believe that a large number of inhabitants built dwellings of grass and mud on the terrace ridges. Since no trace of Poverty Point clothing remains, scientists can only speculate as to how these ancient people dressed. They probably wore simple clothing made from animal skin. Much more is known about how they adorned themselves. Archaeologists have found jewelry, including copper and galena beads. In fact, this great variety of jewelry indicates that personal status and social standing were more evident here than other American cultures of the same period. The people of Poverty Point made many unique objects, but none were more elaborate than those having symbolic meaning. Among most southeastern Indians, such items were considered sacred, or they were used as symbols of tribal identity. This might be what is represented by owls from the Poverty Point culture, which were carved in jasper. Other ordinary objects that may have been given special religious significance include those that were engraved. The animals represented are all important in the lore of Southeast Indians. The little small carvings of jasper owls, the uh, various geometrical forms, there's even a little frog carved in red jasper. These seem to be uh, images of animals uh, that probably stand for uh, animals represented in the, in the myths of these people. Undoubtedly, these great monuments were constructed with an organizational plan that required millions of hours of labor to complete. The large earthworks and huge quantities of trade materials have led scientists to conclude that Poverty Point was not only a large society, but a sophisticated one. I think that the politics boil down to a gifting kind of uh, political system, uh, which was uh, uh, didn't require armies to maintain, didn't require a warrior body, and it required no real power on the part of the uh, principal peoples involved. It was simply a suggestion to do earthwork building, and people agreed to do it because they thought it was a good idea. We're talking about a community that existed here on the Mason Ridge in northeast Louisiana that raised the, uh, the act of giving to the certain point that they were able to develop uh, certain kinds of exchange systems and uh, earthwork construction and not really controlling the labor but directing the labor toward the construction of these large facilities that no other contemporary culture in America was able to do at that time. And that really is what sets Poverty Point culture 
apart from the other archaic cultures in America. Archaeologists' findings at Poverty Point present a new perspective on the evolution of society in America. Evidence suggests that ancient American hunter-gatherers lived in sophisticated communities. These prehistoric people were capable not only of harnessing natural resources for survival, but creating magnificent works and exploring territories for the benefit of the entire community. Just as Middle Eastern societies built upon the achievements of previous generations, the Poverty Point Society progressed along a continuum that began with its predecessor at Watson Brake. Poverty Point lives on timelessly as the foundation of North American society.